bring them over here. What's up? What's up? What's up, man? I don't know. She's got my car, but she's based on my car.
everyone. I'm going to invite my school board colleagues to come up to the stage, please, so that we can go ahead and begin the meeting tonight. We are so thrilled to be here at Truce Elementary. We feel so welcome already. So the regular meeting of the Kansas City Public Schools Board of Directors of March 11th is now called to order. Welcome everyone to Treast Elementary. The secretary will call the roll. Ms. Manser? Here. Mr. Abarca? Present. Ms. Cortez? Here. Mr. Hogan? Here. Dr. Jones? Here. Mr. Wasserstrom? Here. Ms. Wolfsey? Here. Thank you. I'd like to ask my colleagues to please take a look at this evening's agenda for the meeting and if it would be in order to receive a motion for acceptance of the agenda. Second. Is there any discussion about the agenda? Hearing none, the secretary will call the roll. Ms. Spencer? Yes. Mr. Abarca? Yes. Ms. Cortez? Yes. Mr. Hogan? Yes. Dr. Jones? Yes. Mr. Mr. Wasserstrom? Yes. Ms. Wolfsey? Yes. Thank you. The agenda is approved. The next item of business is the workshop presentation. The chair recognizes Dr. Bedell. Thank you, Madam Chair. At this time, um, we will start with our welcome. This is our underworld board meeting, and um, we are looking forward to hearing from our principal here at Troost. I'm not sorry, I, Doctor. I just blanked out on your name that quick. <laughs> Dr. Shonda Fowler. I'm sorry, I just blanked out. So Dr. Fowler uh, came to us uh, a little bit over a year and a half ago, and we were fortunate to get her from Hickman Mills. Uh, several times that I've come to visit this year, I've heard a lot of positive things from her staff members about the direction that this school is heading in. Uh, the morale and just the feel of, of the team being together and I actually shared that with her one day after I had conducted a visit. We had an opportunity this morning to uh, spend some time here and I had an opportunity to also talk to several of our students. Uh, but we're extremely excited about what you're doing with the team here and the dedicated teachers, many who've been here for quite a while. And we want to go ahead and allow for you to conduct your welcome. Thank you for hosting us today. Dr. Fowler. <laughs> to our distinguished guests, um, Kansas City Public Schools Board of Directors, Dr. Bedell, members of the cabinet, family, and friends, all of you here, welcome to Truce Elementary School, home of the Tigers. Please allow me this opportunity just to share a little bit of history about Truce um, with you. Truce Elementary is named after Truce Boulevard, and Truce Boulevard is named after Dr. Benoit Truce, who was considered the first physician to live in Kansas City, Missouri. Right now, the original Truce was a block away um, from here, and where we are right now, um, this Truce was erected in 1922. Our original address was in the back of me on Forest, but after some renovations, Truce became um, our our building was on um, 59th Street, so it's changed around since um, the 80s. And then there were some renovations at Truce during the 80s. And after the renovations in the 80s, um, when we started in the front, I'm so proud to say that after 25 to 30 years, this summer, Truce received an extreme makeover. And we're so happy, we're so proud, and we're loving it. Now, Truce is changing the narrative. What are we doing at Truce? How are we creating our story? Well, first I'd like to tell you that we have 333 students, 176 boys, 157 girls at Truce who are built for greatness. We have dedicated teachers and staff who work tirelessly to help students meet their academic, attendance, and social and emotional goals. And I must say, since day one, we have been meeting our state assigned attendance goals, so we're happy about that. And you will see academic improvement at Truist Elementary School. We strive hard and believe that it is criminal and educational malpractice if we do not give Truist our very best every day. So with our dedicated staff, that's what we are doing. 
And even when the going gets tough, there are no acceptable losses. So what are we doing to change the narrative at Truce? We are building healthy and positive relationships. And that's through the work of our liaison, um, our family school liaison, Ms. Freeman. She's working with our parents so we can have positive relationships. On any given day, you will see True celebrating academics, behavior, reading, students of the month, spirit weeks, just to name a few. And some of you have probably seen me in festive attire at many of our meetings because I will have those at, um, uniforms on on any given day. We also have close connections with LINK, which is our after school program, the Church of the Resurrection that provides us with a lot of opportunities, the Greater Kansas City Chapter of the Links, our VIP program, Big and Bright Smiles, 4963 organization, and our Blue Hills Homes Association and other community organizations that support the efforts here at Truist Elementary. But some of our big rocks I would like to close with. We have several cultural experiences here at Truce. We are going where people may not expect us to be, and when we leave this building, we are doing great things. We have attended plays at the Kaufman Center, the Folly Theater, the Coterie Theater, and our Littles, the Muppet Theater. And the students are getting front row seats to these events, and they are doing us proud here at Truce. They also have an appreciation of the arts um, through the work that we do with the Nelson Atkins Museum. We even have docents who come in here and work with our students. Last summer, we sent a group of young ladies to Oklahoma State where they learned um, skills to become girl bosses. And um, we still have mentors who work with our students. And I'm waiting for this next group to pitch their business proposals to me so we can see how they're doing. And the mentors who work with these young ladies, they will work with them until high school and beyond. So we have a group of fifth grade girls right now who are working with girl bosses. So I believe we have a millionaire in the making here at Truist Elementary School. A few weeks ago, we sent a group of sixth grade students um, to a steam car show at the convention center, and two of our groups made top 10. But out of 127 cars there, Truce um, came in first place out of 127. <laughs> And finally, we are extremely proud of our robotics team. Um, last year, we started a robotics team for the first time here at Truce, and that was under the leadership of um, Ms. Camille Wilcox. She took those third grade students, and we stepped out of our box, and we said, yes, we can. And those students went to Detroit. They showed out. They were recognized and invited back. And you can see the um, students on the, um, up um, on the board now. And they, um, they did an awesome job, and they were invited back this year. But of course, unfortunately, it's been postponed. It's not canceled. But I'd like to thank um, the CTE department, because they believe in the dream and truth, and they are funding that when we get the new dates. So San Antonio, they need to look out for truth. <laughs> um, so finally, let me uh, take my seat. And so you can see some of the greatness that's going on here at Truce. And I have um, four students that are in our Reader's Theater who will um, do a reading for you. And then you'll hear an ensemble from our music department under the leadership of Ms. Suzette Fears. OK. And I'd like you to see their shirts. They were, these were donated through our VIP program that supports us here at Truist. We now present to you a 
unbreakable. We rock people, people we are rocked. Strong like boulders, our shoulders shoulder the heavy weight. Beating us like seven trees, being business is crazy, but vicious been pouring the rain. But I will not break, you will not break, we will not break. In oh. Kansas City, the heart of a nation. We have similar frustrations from coast to coast. Dividing lines, multiple property, equality, and crime. Add in challenging schools, minus many options. This drove you and I to hop in and lock in. And to hurl our rocks into AC that will shake the core of our society. Echoing, echoing. Into more individuals like you and me who transform our communities at the core. When you walk through the door, you make sure to strive. Every stone. We will have a chance to soar. Regardless of demographics, zip codes, bank accounts, or credit scores. Yes. A baby was born today, and I am sad to say the base of their birth location. Mixed with their marvelous melanin, dwelling in five-digit zip codes will be a primary indication of what type of exposure to violence and education they will attain. Ladies and gentlemen, we are facing a crisis. Cry, bro. Crisis. Tears stream down our face and get placed in the heart of action. You and I hear the cries. And step it up and act in. Our homes, our schools, and you and me. Making sure every student, every scholar will have a chance to soar. Regardless of demographic zip codes, big accounts, and credit scores. Fast, 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 period. Are you hearing this? No more fearing this. We rock people. People, we are rocks. Strong like boulders, our shoulders shoulder the heavy weights, bending us like stubborn trees, being bliss and sweat, a vicious winds and pouring rain. But
All right, thank you, uh, Dr. Fowler. I want to once again thank each and every single one of our students and the educators that prepared them to perform today. If we could give them all another round of applause. For uh, many of our guests who are here today, parents, uh, faculty and staff, and some of our students, what you just witnessed is an example of the many things that we're doing in this school district to develop our kids not only academically, but socially and emotionally. And we think that uh, having our kids be involved in extracurriculars can be a game changer for many of these students. Um, I have a statement I'm going to read to you in a, in a second. I did want to share this with you. Uh, I'm very proud of where this school district is going. And we understand that we've had a history and we've had a lot of fighting that we've had to do here in Kansas City to ensure that every single one of our scholars get what they deserve on all three fronts, socially, emotionally, and academically. And many of you have stayed right here side by side helping support us in that. We are beginning to see the fruits and labors of that hard work. For some of you who've been in here for 20 years, 15 years, 10 years, uh, the difference that's happening. This year is the first time in recent history where we actually had three of our basketball teams win their district championships. Three. And it, it, it's, it's something to be proud of. It's something to be proud of. Uh, we actually had two heartbreakers where Central High School lost by two points on Saturday. And it was a heartbreaker because we just didn't get the last shot off even though we had the ball and potentially could have won that game or at least tied it. Last night, Lincoln College Prep boys lost by one point. Uh, to Lafayette uh, in St. Joseph, uh, and once again, the exact same thing happened where we did we had the ball with 5.6 seconds left and turned the ball over and time ran out on us. But our Lincoln College Prep girls won, and they will be playing on Saturday, I believe, at 6 o'clock at the Silverstein Arena, um, and I think that they're playing against Grain Valley. We think they will have an excellent opportunity to move on to go back to the Final Four at, in Springfield for states. And that's two years in a row for that team, potentially. Uh, as you all know, I wanted to share some brief thoughts in response to the well-publicized event that occurred following the Lincoln Prep versus Van Horn High School game last Friday evening. At the heart of matters, it is irresponsible to engage in an unproductive dialogue when we fundamentally disagree about what happened. However, it's important to me that I provide some clarity for our students, our staff, and of course our community that's here tonight. I will always be a strong advocate on behalf of our schools, and being an advocate, I also have a responsibility to not give a pass when I see wrongs. I have made student engagement and being present my top priority as a teacher, as a principal, as a coach, and as a school district leader. I lead with both the head and the heart while understanding the challenges of leading kids out of poverty, whether it's academically, socially, or emotionally. What we do offer through academics, athletics, and arts provides true pathways for students to break the cycle of poverty. Our work and my interactions are too important to be distracted by falsities. Distractions detract from our students knowing that we have their backs, and that's our primary focus. It's a primary focus of our strategic plan. Goal two, making sure that our children are supported, making sure that we're developing their well-being socially and emotionally, and that comes through these extracurricular activities, whether it's social organizations, whether it's kids performing in band, whether it's kids performing in athletics. We strive to be portrayed accurately, and in our effort to do so, we will protect our narrative and balk at falsities. In this, I want to be very clear that my character has been falsely portrayed in recent comments from others outside of our KCPS community. My values and my beliefs have been evident from day one in this community through a body of work that cannot be disputed. And for me, I get a little emotional because I do, I wear my emotions on my sleeve. And I want to say this, it is for this reason that I would never approach, 
I would never taught, I would never instigate students or an adult from another school system as a result of winning. I'm not built in that manner. I'm a lifelong athlete. I currently coach right now eight-year-old girls at the Linwood Y. I open up the gym on Saturdays during off-season at Central High School where I preach to everybody who comes in there, sportsmanship, no profanity, no fighting. And if those things happen, we will shut the gym down. And on those Saturdays, we have students coming in, not only from our school district, we've had students come in from other school districts to play. And it has been a wonderful community builder. And therefore, it's something that I would never condone. I want you all to know that I have held people accountable for displaying these types of actions that I have been falsely accused of during my years as an executive leader across multiple school systems where I have supervised athletics. I look forward to working through any upcoming processes to resolve this incident, and I look forward to continuing to demonstrate truth in how I have always approached my conversations in the work that I'm doing on behalf of the Kansas City Public School District. Thank you, Dr. Riddell. Um, I know that you have heard this from me privately, but I'd like to say this publicly. There isn't a person on this stage that doesn't believe in your leadership, doesn't understand and hasn't seen and felt your integrity, knows that you are ultimately about the success of children, and that you do everything you model for us every day, the value of teamwork, good sportsmanship, working together, and holding ourselves at the highest level of accountability, not only for the children that we're educating, but for the adults who work with us, and for the people in the community who are depending upon us. So I, I hope that you know that, but I want this community to know that we stand behind you as a leader and proud to have you as our superintendent. I would like to invite my colleagues, if anyone wants to say anything briefly before we continue with the program. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. <clears throat> So, um, I will say a couple of things. Um, I, was, I was at the event um, last week along with um, our chair, um, as well as uh, some of Dr. Bedell's uh, administrative team. And while I wasn't there for the incident, um, I do know the man that's being accused. Um, and I do know that the accusations couldn't possibly be true. And I know that because I've observed Dr. Bedell as I've walked through the halls of schools in Kansas City with him. As I've interacted with him both professionally here um, in, in our work as, as a school board and a superintendent. Um, I've interacted with him privately. Um, I've also walked through the halls and through the city streets of Louisville as part of a conference with Dr. Bedell. Um, and I can tell you that all you need to do is look around at the people who interact with Dr. Bedell and the reaction that they have to him to know of his character. Um, and it's like walking around with a rock star. It's actually kind of odd, right? Because <laughs> he's a superintendent. We don't think of superintendents as being these sort of, these people that sort of pull people in and, and just attract them to, to themselves. And Dr. Bedell does that. Um, and look, I would put my life in this guy's hands. And I've known him less, for less than a year. And I know you guys don't know me personally, but if you knew me, you'd know how powerful that statement is. I don't trust easily, but when I trust, I trust wholly. And I would not only put my life in his hands, but I would do whatever it takes to protect him and his character, because I know the work that he's doing here in this school district is important. It's having an impact, and it will continue to have an impact long after he's gone. So I stand with you and by you and here for you and whatever you need me to be. All right, I think I figured this out. Uh, Dr. Bedell, I... I I was not there at the event. Uh, I was actually very surprised when I saw the accusations um, that were levied on you. Um, and it set me back um, and made me realize the importance of a broader discussion of equity in the field of education. As we've seen the landscape um, amongst boards and superintendents and that dynamic being challenged around issues of equity, that's what came to me initially. 
um, off the bat is, are you being treated equitably as a person? And in the response from the district, the reality of saying, well, I didn't realize that was a superintendent. Would you have said that to anyone? That struck me as the holistic truth that I needed to hear. And whether I was there or not didn't matter because I knew the integrity that you have and that you hold for us and others that unfortunately the truth was not being told to the press. So thank you for standing strong and for standing up for our district and our students and standing true um, to the core of equity that you have in this field. So for that, I applaud you. Thank you, Dr. Goodell. I'm going to return the program back to you. All right. Thank you, and uh, thank you all for giving me an opportunity. Thank you all for giving me an opportunity to share that uh, statement with you and, and for your support. It means the world to me. Um, we, let's get into the fun part. This is the most enjoyable part of being on the road, being able to recognize our uh, top AP students, our scholar superstars, our, our terrific teammates, outstanding administrators, and community champions. Uh, Ms. Master and I will go down and uh, stay down throughout the process. I think we will start off at this point with uh, Ms. Nicole Collier-White, who will recognize our top AP students uh, and provide, I think, scholarships through KCPS Education Foundation. Yes. Good right. evening, everyone. I'm very excited to be part of this important uh, celebration tonight and just grateful for the opportunity to highlight some of our amazing students within KCPS. Uh, about a year ago, Dr. Shepard in a cabinet meeting actually said, you know, I want to find a way that we can highlight our top AP students. We have a lot of students that take the test, some score really high, and she wanted to find a way to honor them and celebrate them. What she didn't know is that immediately after that meeting, someone who was in the room came to my office and said, I want to step in and I want to find a way to celebrate those students. So at this time, I want to bring Ms. Sandra Fetty up to the front. For those who don't know, uh, Sandra Fetty is the executive admin for Dr. Bedell. But not only that, she is a champion for public schools, she's a champion for students, and more importantly, Kansas City Public Schools. She stands in the gap, and she helps probably everybody in this room when we're in our time of need, um, and she really just honors and cares about these students. And she, thus far this year, she's provided a washer and dryer to Knott's Elementary, to Garcia Elementary, and she's planning some library dens in two elementary schools this fall. But tonight, she is with me because we are going to honor three students who scored extremely well on the AP test during the 2019-2020 school year. So at this time, can I please have Rama Muhammad from Northeast High School come to the front? Can I have Isabella Henke from East High School? And Atronise Jones from East High School. Foundation and the Fetty Family Fund, congratulations on your successful academic career. Next year, when you're at Purdue for engineering, when you're at MU for vet school, and when you're at UMKC for nursing, can you hear that again? That's Purdue for engineering, <laughs> that's MU for vet school. of you, loving on you, celebrating you, and cheering you on as you go into the next phase of your life. We are extremely proud of you. Thank you for not only honoring yourselves, but honoring this district and your success. And on behalf of KCPS and the Fetty Family Fund, here is $500 to put towards your uh, academic career steps. All right. Okay. Back here. 
The next portion of our evening consists of us recognizing several people, including students and adults, who support our schools in a variety of ways. And first, we're going to recognize um, our scholar superstars. So I'm going to call each of these students up, as we're also going to watch a video about them. So if I can have Alicia Hoskins. from AC Prep, Eli, Hale Cook, and Sophie from Waterstar. Thanks for being here, guys. We're going to watch a short video that recognizes each of these students. She is a hard worker. She probably has a minimum of about four questions a day about what the assignment is, what she should be understanding. If she doesn't understand something, all I know with that. Um, and so she's always going to rub and get on to make sure that she knows what is going on in class. Um, but also she's constantly helping around the building. She is a active member of the front office helping with that stuff. Her peers come to her for either advice or help or um, questions or ideas for the school. Um, and she's a natural leader. Eli is an excellent candidate for this award because he's incredibly curious. He's a wonderful role model and leader in our classroom. He's always questioning, asking more details about any content that we're studying. He's just a wonderful student to have in class. Sophie Miller was recommended um, not only for her academic and social growth over the first half of the school year, um, but mostly because of the advocacy she did um, for her peers and for the animals in our classroom. You know why they were videoing you? You did. You did. Ms. Hoskins, you might not know it's a little bit of a surprise. So we're going to present you with a certificate from Ms. Manser and Dr. Bedell. And we're going to take your picture. Excellent. Congratulations. Are there any family members here who would like to stand up and take some photos as well? I think there's a couple people with their phones out already. Yeah, you're welcome to go take a picture. And it's looking over here in front of the banners and take your pictures. Congratulations again. Alicia, Eli, and Sophie. There we go. We're getting our photo gallery in place. And the paparazzi are ensuing. Any other family members want to take a picture? And we can do one individual ones as well, so if we would like. Oh, we have some more. We have some more. Yes, we do. Let's do this. Excellent. Congratulations again, ladies and gentlemen. Congratulations. And families, thank you for joining us this evening to bring them and let them receive their awards and see them get their awards. All right, next. Um, next, we're going to do terrific teammates. And these folks who are here, we're going to call you up um, individually, and then we're going to read a little bit about you according to what your nominees said in their nomination form. So let's go to the first one. And if we can have Andrea Cook come up. Andrea, can you please come up? Andrea! So I'm going to read a little bit about what each of the nominees said, or each of the nominators said about the nominees. So this is what they said about Andrea Cook. Andrea's in our technology department. 
Andrea is a great teammate to work with day in and day out. Together, the digital learning team has reimagined PD for our district by creating online personalized learning for teachers. In all, we've been able to touch several hundred teachers through online PD. Andrea is quick to think up new ways to increase teacher tech efficacy in order to provide our students with a 21st century learning environment. Together, the digital learning team has attended conferences, created a technology mentoring program, rolled out a platform for students and teachers to connect with real world professionals, and much more. Andrea makes me want to come to work every day and help model what an effective with psychological safety looks like. Congratulations, Andrea. Yeah, we'll get individual pictures, yep. And then we're going to bring you, Dr. Shepard's going to bring you a, a, your terrific teammate star as well. If you want to, we can take it out of the box. We can show that thing off in your photo. They're, they might be difficult to open, though. They're wrapped in there tightly. <laughs> and Dr. Bedell wants one of those sweaters, he just said. Me too. Oh, who said that? Oh, Mandy said that. I think we can probably, I think we can probably arrange that. All right, congratulations again, Andrea. All right, can we have next um, Janine Fells come up, please? All right, hi, Ms. Fells. You get to go stand over there with Dr. Bedell and Ms. Manser while I read this about you. Janine Fells is from Hart Hartman Elementary, and this is what was said about Ms. Fells. Ms. Fells brings passion to the subject and a love of learning to her classroom. She wants to make a difference in students' lives. She connects with her students and coworkers, and she always starts out with a let's talk in her class. It's a class discussion on what is going on in the student's life, keeping the learning and developing her own knowledge and skills. Congratulations, Ms. Fells. Congratulations again, Ms. Spells. All right, moving on to our next terrific teammate. We have Brent Amos. Is Brent here this evening? I don't know that Brent's here this evening. Okay, Brent is a district plumber, and we're happy to recognize him tonight um, as nominated from the classified team. Let's move on to the next one then. Um, terrific teammate, Yamina Muhammad, are you here? Also, we have a special guest with you as well. We have a special guest tonight. Excellent. Well, come up and we'll read a little bit about you. Who's your special guest tonight? Your granddaughter. Tell me her name again. Kamara. Kamara. Hi, guys. You guys go up here with Dr. Bedell and Ms. Manser while we read a little bit about you. With her purse. Excellent. <laughs> All right. Ms. Muhammad is a backbone. She's at Southeast High School, and she's the cultural arts educator. Ms. Muhammad is a backbone and source of strength and support for our students. Many of our deeds go unnoticed because she does not broadcast her caring acts, such as providing clothing, bus fare, snacks, and lunch to countless students. She does these things because that is who she is. Ms. Muhammad understands the direct connection between students' needs being met on a basic level and how that is a direct connection to student success and academic achievement. Congratulations, Ms. Muhammad. Moving on, we have Melvin Brown, terrific teammate. All right, Melvin Brown. <laughs> Melvin Brown is at Paseo Academy, and he is with the parent and community involvement. All right, here we go, Melvin. Melvin takes it upon himself to provide exceptional support and service to staff, students, and our families. He discerns quickly their individual needs and moves efficiently to provide key information, recommendations, or direction. Fondly known as the go-to for most things at our campus, Melvin receives calls daily from offices throughout the university, students, and parents who call upon his experience and know-how for information. 
He is helpful, caring, resourceful, and happy to offer service no matter the task. Melvin often performs above and beyond and recently offered expertise and planning skills to navigate a job search to the point of providing detailed itineraries for several external candidates. His quick wit, attention to detail, and loyalty to our school has endeared him to our colleagues. He is a true champion for education with a tireless commitment to serving. It has been said both he and our arts coordinator are the glue that holds things together around here. Congratulations, Melvin Brown. Congratulations. And lastly, do we have Jessica Vaughn here from <laughs> Not only do we have Jessica Vaughn, we have a cheering committee of colleagues, it looks like. Thank you all for being here. Jessica Vaughn is a third grade teacher at Banneker Elementary. Ms. Vaughn, this was said about you. You're the most positive, encouraging person I know to the staff and to the students. You, have always been a, you always have a smile on your face, even on the toughest days. You are a rock for Banneker Elementary, and we are proud to acknowledge you this evening as a terrific teammate. Congratulations. <laughs> So I think we need a picture with the cheering squad and Mr. Harrison with your signs. Will you guys come up as well, please? Come on, I think we need a picture with your signs. Um, Mr. Weichel, will we have enough room for everybody up there? We'll make it work. And these three fine folks are going to get called forward as well. All right, can we have Dr. Chris? Well, Dr. Sly is not going to be able to be here tonight, so we'll recognize her with our review here. But Julie Lynch from Hale Cook, please. Uh, Julie Lynch, principal of Hale Cook, as well as Chanel Smith, associate principal of AC Prep. Chanel Smith here. There she is. show a short video about these um, fine women as well. Hi, my name is uh, Mr. Murphy. I uh, am an instructional coach and third grade teacher here at Carver Dual Language, and I have the privilege, the great privilege to work with Dr. Sly. Uh, she is just an amazing uh, educator, but just person all around. And what makes Dr. Sly a great uh, person around Carver is that she, like, um, is like nice to all of us and she's a vice principal so she like helps other people and she runs student council and recycling so like she helps us like learn more about community and stuff like I'm a student council president and she helps me like be a better like, person and stuff and she's a good uh, vice principal and she's nice. She's positive. She really uh in that positivity, she's able to build relationships, and through those relationships, she's able to push all of us uh, to just do our very best. And she's just um, excellent at what she does. I'm so glad that she's uh, getting recognized. Lunch is a great administrator is that she's not only our boss she's not only our administrator but she's also our teammate and everything that we do she's there to help us be the best, best version of ourselves she is a great 
teacher, like, like she's so nice. She's so mean, like, she's so nice to every kid in the school. So, she's a really nice person. She's there to help us be the best teachers that we can be. No matter what we're struggling with, we can go to her and she'll help us and she will help the students through anything and everything that they're working on. So she's not just a great administrator, she's a great teammate. Uh, what makes Miss Smith a great educator is number one, she's a student advocate first. So she listens to her students when they have a problem. Even when they may not be expressing their problem in the best manner, she listens to them, tries to find a solution, and tries to support them through whatever it is that they need. Um, for me, I feel like she's like my second mama. She always, like, ever since I was a freshman here, she always been on me about my grades and my attitude. Because last year, my attitude was horrible. And this year, I feel like she changed me. She still, she makes sure that I'm doing good every day. And she, I don't know what, but she get, she have this bond. She make a bond with every single person in the school. If it, whether they didn't like her at first or if they were scared to talk to her, she always made a close bond. And she's just an all-around great person to know in this work. And I don't know what I would do at something without her. Congratulations, ladies. Yay, congratulations. Congratulations. Come on the Oh, personal photo here. All right, we're going to move on to our community champions next. This is our last portion of recognitions for the evening. And it's Linda Brown here. Can Linda please come up? Hi, Linda. Come on up, my dear. Um, we are going this evening to um, highlight Linda Brown. And here's what we're going to talk about with her. We also have a video for her. But you go over there with Dr. Bedell and Ms. Manser, then we're going to talk about you a little bit. <laughs> so Linda is from the Blue Hills Neighborhood Association. And it's our pleasure to welcome you as our community champion this evening from the Blue Hills Neighborhood Association. Um, Linda Brown is here as the Neighborhood Association President. KCPS honors community partners that uphold a legacy of service through trusting relationships and a passionate and unwavering commitment to equity, social justice, and educational excellence on behalf of students and families in KCPS. The Blue Hills Neighborhood Association works with multiple schools in our district to provide scholarship opportunities, financial support, and plenty of volunteer hours. Ms. Brown, thank you for being tonight on behalf of the Blue Hills Neighborhood Association. And we have a short video to show highlighting Ms. Brown as well. I'm Linda Brown, and my position with Blue Hills Neighborhood Association, I'm the president of Blue Hills. I'm Judith Boyd, and I'm the treasurer Neighborhood Association. Two years ago, almost three now, the board of Blue Hills decided that we need to make a commitment for our youth in the neighborhood. And after much discussion, we thought one of the best ways to support our youth was to support the schools where they were in attendance, to provide some additional funding to those principals so that they could support the children in a way that the district at this point uh, can't afford to do. The relationship in itself, because we are a neighborhood association, which means we are touching the people in the neighborhoods. We're dealing with the young people in the schools, but then that builds a relationship with the parents as well. And when they see that the neighborhood cares enough that we're coming into schools and see, we saying that we give a thousand dollars to each, but we also give time. Deep sense of satisfaction. I, when our scholarship winners last year came to one of our meetings, mm -hmm. the residents in attendance stood and applauded. They felt proud that they helped these young people make a decision to go to college. Why wouldn't we? First of all, 
because Kansas City Public School, we're products of Kansas City Public School. So we know how important Kansas City Public School is. And there's charter schools that are going on, but still the Kansas City Public School is the root of our community and we still have enough schools that need the support. And then when you think of your schools, you say, well, Truce Elementary is a public school. King Elementary, the city. These are schools that need our help and we're not leaving them behind. And can your colleague come up as well? Yes, I'm glad. Tell us your name again. Judith Boyd, the treasurer, correct? Thank you for being here, Ms. Boyd. We have more? We have more. What is your name, my dear? Toy Wilson, assistant treasurer. Oh, Miss Wilson, assistant treasurer. She's here as well. Thank you for joining us. Can I get an assistant treasurer, please? <laughs> Oh, we have someone else. We would love to have you. Come on, member. And your name? Iva Easley, member of the Blue Hills Neighborhood Association. tonight. Uh, I'm really excited about our workshop presentation uh, for the people who are able to remain. Uh, you're in for a treat. The work that we're doing around uh, focus on graduating students that are college and career ready in alignment with our board policy but also in alignment with MSIP 5 and the upcoming MSIP 6 which is uh, the accountability system for the state of Missouri. I want to bring Dr. Shepard up, and I know Dr. Shepard, you're on the timeline here, so I know you need to do your part and then uh, need to exit out of here for your next event. Uh, so we want to go ahead and get started with our workshop presentation. Very excited about this, uh, members of the board, and I think you will see the cohesiveness coming together. Yes. Good evening, Board Chair Manser, Board of Directors, and Dr. Bedell and community. Tonight, our team will be presenting on Board Policy 1.2.1, College and Career Readiness, and we are very excited about that. Our team has met for the past six months as a College and Career Readiness Task Force, and I'd like to recognize all of the members of our team that have been on that task force. Would you please stand? Thank you. We've had some very challenging conversations and some really good conversations, but I think we have arrived at a point where we feel like we have a great roadmap to move us forward with college and career readiness for our district. The visual that you have in your hands is the culmination of our work. Tonight, you will hear about all of the pieces and how they align with the Missouri School Improvement Program, or MSIP 5. We're excited about this work and the opportunities for our students to access college and careers at a higher rate. You heard earlier, we had three students who were recognized for high scores on their AP exam 
and for the colleges and universities that they'll be attending next year. Our goal is to make sure that we have more and more and more success stories such as these. The, next, the first person you will hear is Jerome Williams and he will review the CCR standards and accountability and he'll provide updates on where we are currently and then the rest of the task force will come through and they'll explain and describe to you where we are and what our one to three year goals are and then they'll also take questions. Thank you. I know Dr. Shepard has been coming up. I know I think I heard you say it but we will at the end of each section allow for board to ask questions so we don't have to get to the end and have people shuffling back up. Yes. Our theory of action, I'm going to present that first. And we've gone over this before, but I'm going to go over it with you again because everything about this theory of action has guided the work that we've done. We started with the theory of action and all of us collaboratively created this. If KCPS creates quality, equitable, and innovative experiences using database decisions to close achievement and opportunity gaps, then college and career ready graduates will successfully access and navigate post-secondary opportunities. So it is our goal that we create environments and conditions that our kids can all access college and career opportunities. So Mr. Williams will come up first and then you'll hear from the rest of the team. Good evening. Um, as Dr. Shepard said, I'm going to go over CCR standard indicators um, one, three, sorry, it would be um, one, three, which are assessments, four, advanced placement, five, post secondary, post secondary placement. So the matrix that you're looking at right now is just for review purposes. Again, this is standard three, college and career readiness indicator one, three. This is going to be your assessments. And so this is what the state uses um, for that 1-3 metric. You can see the assessments are running down um, the left side of the column and then the student weight associated with each assessment is on the top there. Um, just for reference, ACT, a composite score with no record of participation, that means there's a senior um, or a graduate who has no record of participation, has never taken a test, that student will receive a zero. Um, less than uh, 17 would be a 0.25, 18 to 21 would be a 0.75. A 1 would be 25, 22 to 25, and a 1.25 weight would be a 26 to 36 score on the ACT. Um, and then the other tests have a similar, similar data there, just um, different scores associated with each test. For indicator 4, which is going to be your advanced placement, we're looking at AP, which is advanced placement, IB, Project Lead Away, PLTY, and IRC, which is an industry recognized credential, dual credit, or dual enrollment. So what we're going to talk about next is going to be our three-year goals for our APR. Again, standard three and no, indicator three and the uh, associated um, CCR standards within each one. So we're going to have goals for all three standards. They're based off of a three-year average. Um, I want to point out that monitoring participation this is something that we've been very intentional with this year. We are constantly monitoring where we're at so that we can know where we're, where we're going to go. And for SY20, we've got some as of Friday data. Um, it's preliminary there, but I'll just say as of Friday because again, these numbers will change throughout the year as you know students graduate and they are uh, assessed and they receive um, grades for particular courses. So the first one we're looking at here is going to be standard three, one three, your assessments. So SY18, we're at 43.6% of graduates scoring at or above the state standard. For 19, we were at 39. 20, we want to be at 44. That's the goal for SY20. For SY21, it would be 48. For SY22, it would be 50. Okay, as of last Friday, we were sitting at 36.1. But again, keep in mind, there are two more dates, national ACT testing dates. We are currently administering AccuPlacer in the schools in um, partnership with MCC. And any student that is going to graduate that does not have a CCR assessment, we're planning for those students to take the ASVAP assessment, um, which again is free of charge. 
Um, and the ASVAB also comes with a CEP, which is a career exploration program for each individual kid, which falls right in line with what we've got going on here with CCR. Um, just to you know, clarify any confusion, when we say percent at or above the state standard, I'll go back to the matrix here. If you've got a student that is graduating and did not take an assessment, they're going to get a zero, right? You've got another student that took the assessment and got a 16, they're going to get a 0.25. And then you've got a student that got a 28, that student is going to get a 1.25. You add those all up, divide it by three, and your percentage will be 50%, right? So that's where those numbers come, come into play there for SY18. So it's not really, you have to add the student weight into the calculation and then it's taken as an aggregate, right? For standard three, um, indicator four, advanced placement, we were at 44.9 in SY18, 39.7 in 19. Our goal for 20 is gonna be 43. 21, 46, and 22, 49. We can't really provide an as of, you know, rate for this particular indicator because these are based off of end of course grades and then IRCs the students are gonna take later on in the year um, and project lead away. We have some preliminary data, but we would rather wait until the end of the school year to actually display that, right? Post-secondary placement, five, six. 18, we're at 88.9, 1991.7. Our goal for SY20 is 92. 21 would be 93, and 22 is 95. Uh, what's important here, this is typically an indicator that we score better than the state, right? Post-secondary placement, we do a good, great job of placing our graduates, whether it's in four-year, two-year, military, or working, right? So it's important we stay above that 90% threshold when you look at the data as of March 6th, which was last Friday, we were sitting at 87.4%. Again, we have time to identify where our graduates from last year um, fit in those categories, whether they're working, whether they're in the military. Um, the thing about employment is, is that it doesn't have to be related to a CTE program. So if you graduated with the health science program, you, know, you don't have to be working as a CNA. You could be working um, at KC Water Department, for instance, right? and that still qualifies um, as a positive placement for our students. Um, again, I want to point out that we've been very intentional with this this year. Okay, we're constantly looking at student data because we're not going to have a situation like we had in 19, which we've talked about before, where you, know, you see that 39%. That's not that our students weren't doing well on the assessment. It's that we had quite a few students that graduated without having a CCR assessment. Right? And that will not happen again. We've got the CCR task force, we've got graduation PLC, again, where we're constantly monitoring, talking about data, talking to the schools, and we've got a great idea of uh, you know, what our plan is moving forward. Mr. Abarca? Can we go back to, I think it's slide 35? Uh, so, question about this component, right? So say I take the ACT and get an 18, and then I take the ASVAP and get a 63. How, how does a student like that get counted in this type of system? So uh, great question. And to your question, it's important that students receive multiple measures for assessments because in that scenario, you know, if the kid gets an 18, he's sitting at a 0.75. When he gets that 63 or 66, he's gonna get a one. Right, so they take the highest score. Um, again, multiple measures of assessment are important because we know that you know, people have bad days. You know, a student may show up and maybe they had a rough night or there was something going on at home and they didn't, they didn't do as well on the test as they could have done if they would have had more time or been in a different situation. So one follow-up to that, you, I know you had said that you, you have the task force and such to make sure that's, that, this, that a test is taken. Are you then looking at also trying to stretch that a little bit to say at least two of these per se are taken to maximize that opportunity for success or what's the strategy then? Yeah, absolutely. We do do that as well and we've got initiatives in place like um, our junior census testing date for uh, ACT. So you've got all of our juniors that are sitting for the ACT test their junior year and that provides great baseline data 
that's also an assessment again that we can look at and look to uh, to uh, you know push that student into different types of tutoring or things that they may need to improve that score so that then when they take it as a senior, right, they should do better. Um, in the same scenario, if there's a student that's sitting on the cusp right there with an ACT, let's say they're a 17 or an 18, then we'll have dialogue with the school counselor and talk about offering that student an Accuplacer or an ASVAB, right? I mean, again, that helps us, but it also helps the kid um, if they're able to do better on the second or third assessment. Dr. Jones. Oh, Thank you, Jones. So, um, a couple questions. The first question is, can you say more about what you all do to help students prepare for uh, some of these exams? Particularly, I'm most familiar with ACT and SAT. What kind of supports do we currently provide? So we've got um, ACT tutoring set up in the schools. You know, um, I can't really speak um, to what we're doing um, individually. That, that's more of a curriculum. Um, role, but I do know that we have support set up. And again, from the assessment and research department, what we do is we triangulate that data and we put it together so that people in the schools can look at it and look for areas of opportunity um, within the data set that they're receiving. Yeah, and let me help with that. We do, uh, our schools do offer ACT prep. Uh, we've also, we've done AP prep. We brought kids in on Saturdays to get uh, support. I've taken, I know I've taken my son to the Central Library to get support as they were getting ready. So there's a lot of study groups that also take place, but we have also you know, received emails from teachers that we're going to be offering ACT prep on these following sessions. So there is definitely more of an awareness and, a, and really a, a different level of uh, care and concern um, in our schools for our students. And so, But we've been intentional in particular from student town hall meetings when they told us we don't, we don't get enough support with ACT or enough support with AP. And we just said, hey, we, we're willing to do it. We just need students to show up. Uh, thank you. Some other questions with respect to placement. And so when we think about like uh, the higher KC process that's coming up, um, is there something in particular that uh, you all, the district is already doing to kind of get kids in line to be able to take advantage of this summer opportunity? And is there a way that we as board members could better support um, that effort? What can we do um, to make sure that as many KCPS kids as possible get, get access to the opportunity? Thank you. To that point, the higher KC hiring fair will actually be held at Manual this year. So all of our students at Manual will get that first opportunity. We just had um, the Draw Your Future facilitation with all of our Manual students where they got a chance to uh, recognize some of their goals and kind of figure out um, some things that they could do to um, reach future goals. So like I said, the higher uh, hiring fair will be on March 27th at Manual and we're working with uh, schools to get other students there as well. Mr. Hogan? Uh, thanks, Mr. Williams. Uh, a couple of questions. So on slides 38 and 39, and you might have answered this earlier, so forgive me if I didn't quite uh, didn't quite resonate with me. So looking at the dip from SY18 to 19 in both of those uh, categories, why was that? That was, again, because we had quite a few um, seniors, that graduates left. that left without a CCR assessment. So were we doing something different in 18 where we were monitoring and, and got our number up and then that just sort of dropped off in 19? Yeah, you know, really, th this is exactly what happened. So within our, our SIS system, we've got the ability to mark whether or not a student has completed their CCR assessments, okay? We had a change in our process as far as who could actually enter that information into the assessment panel on Tyler SIS. So the kids were marked but they may have had an Accuplacer score, an ASVAB score that was getting loaded into their student documents and not being transferred over to their assessment panel, right? Um, MSEP, DESE gets a lot of this information directly from the third party testing vendor, right? Which is a lot different than ASVAB. So when we give the ASVAB test to students, we administer that. Well, actually ASVAB will administer it. Those scores come directly to us, which is a lot different than some of these other tests, right? Desi's going to communicate with ACT to find out whether or not a kid takes the, takes the ACT and that calculates into our MSEP performance, right? Uh, we do have an opportunity to appeal that, but if a student misspells their name on the uh, bubble sheet, 
or writes the birth date down wrong, again, that's going to delay your score, which if you're taking a test in June, that's going to push into like August sometimes before we can rectify that student's record. So um, again, the intentional part of that is that this year we've been in constant communication with school leaders, um, counselors, and people of that nature to make sure that we're catching anybody who maybe has a CCR um, complete, but the score is not showing up in our assessment panel. We, we have those dialogues now this year, and it's much more intentional. Okay. And so, I think it's encouraging point for you right there. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I just pulled a Miss Cortez. Uh, <laughs> a little bit of an inside joke there. Uh, sorry. Um, so, I would just encourage the, the same level of rigor year over year and discipline on some of this stuff, right? Because it becomes a, a bit of an operational discipline piece, right? Because sure. God forbid something happens to, to you, right, or someone on your team or whatever, you go away, you go find another job or whatever, a new person comes in or someone gets promoted, right? It's just making sure the systems are in place to make sure that we have that rigor year over year. Um, on, on your preliminary numbers uh, for slides 38 and 40, um, I, I know you said that we've still got time to sort of make it up, but what gives you confidence beyond the monitoring piece of it that you're going to actually get to your goal, not just for the upcoming year, but for years after that as well? I, I think that uh, basically to your point about having a process and a procedure in place so we're not necessarily relying on people, I think that the changes that we've got in place this year will be sustainable over the long run. Um, so that when we're looking at SY22, we can get to that 50%. Um, I, I believe that that will happen. Um, you know, the other thing that we've got for this year, again, we've got two more national testing dates before the end of the year. We've got AccuPlacer with MCC, and then we are providing ASVAB for students that do not currently have a CCR assessment, or students, again, that maybe had a lower ACT score or a lower AccuPlacer score, they'll sit for the ASVAB. Um, the reality is, is that a lot of these tests are correlated, so if, you know, a student takes an ACT and scores a 36, they'll probably ace the AccuPlacer in any other assessment that you'll give them. But if you've got a kid that's on the borderline on the fence on any of those assessments, our students in particular do better on the ASVAB. So we're hoping that, again, catching those students using that assessment is not only going to help us, but again, it'll help them because you don't necessarily have to go to the military, you're gonna get a career exploration program report with that test, which will tell you that, hey, I, I think I'm mechanically inclined. You know, maybe I try to go do something in that realm. One final question, if I can, Madam Chair. So going back to um, our treasurer, Mr. Barca's point around the scenario, and if, if a kid takes two different tests, you know, how many points does he or she get? I just wanna make sure, we're, so we're not double, counting those, right? Yeah. So we're not giving credit for both the exams. The, the, the denominator never changes. It's just the numerator. So the kid gets a 17 on the ACT and then a... Uh, 60, a 63. Yeah, 63 yep. on the ASVAB. That student's weight's going to count for one. Okay, great. Thank you. This is a, a fairly elementary question. You know, I'm competitive enough that if there's a test rather that our students do better than not as good. I understand competition. But in terms of the use of the SAT or ACT test, at least 54 years ago or 57 years ago when I had to worry about SAT, uh, it was not so much a measurement of how well the school district was doing. It was simply a tool uh, in a competitive environment, if a student could get into a prestigious school like Amherst or Princeton, or whether they would be relegated to a lesser tier school like the University of Missouri or a state school. In today's environment, what is the use and importance of uh, SAT and ACT schools? Well, you know, what the research says is that they're used for predicting whether or not a student would be successful in college or whether or not that student is ready for college-level work. I mean, me personally, I think that you need to look at other things when you're judging whether or not you think that a student can be successful. Um, you can look at things like GPA. 
Um, you can look at things like personal relationships that that student has with family, friends, teachers. Uh, the system's not necessarily designed like that right now, and it's not fair. Um, unfortunately, when we're looking at things like this, I mean, as a school district, this is the game that we're playing, right? This is the game that's set up by the state of Missouri, and so we're going to try to play the game to the best of our ability, right? Because um, we are competitive and we do want to win. Um, at the same time, we want to make sure our students are getting the best experience possible and that they're winning as well. Ms. Wolfsey? Um, I have a question on slide 35. So I do know that we do quite a bit as far as ACT tutoring in the schools, and usually that I know from my understanding, will give students maybe a couple of points bump. One of the things that was ex uh, expressed to me a couple of years ago was that it's really content that where you get the big um, lifts in your scores. And, you know, content is over years, right? So I guess my question is, what are you doing or will be doing to take what we're learning out of, I guess, ACT and SAT and the, the data that you get and trying to figure out where maybe our content needs to be addressed to be able to raise those overall scores. Does that make sense? Yeah, I got you. So what we've done is we've basically aligned um, what's the, the Missouri Learning Standards to the ACT assessment. So what we've done, some things start in second grade, some things start in seventh grade, so we've done that full alignment. We also uh, did an ACT boot camp this week, and so we brought in students who had taken the ACT, um, they took it last week, so they came into the boot camp and they got um, some strategies on not only the test taking piece, but the content and how to get through it a lot quicker. And so it was very relevant to the students, they were very excited and they were like, we wish we'd have known this before, but I knew that it would really open their eyes if they had taken the test last week and then someone comes in and shows them how to fix the things that they did. And so they'll be taking the test again. We actually just got the vouchers in today, so that group of students will take the test again April 4th. So. So is it fair to say, Dr. Davis, that um, because of the way that you've mapped the curriculum now, mm -hmm. but clearly that's going to take some time, that really we should start to see improvement year over year over year. Year after year. It'll be over time, but one of the things we're working to encourage teachers to do, some are doing it now, but I think next year it'll be a major focus, is to say this is going to be on the ACT before they teach the content. And I do want to say this, what, what I'm hoping will happen is the students that took the ACT this year that are juniors, that's the first full-blown class across the system that had exposure to pre-ACT in the 9th, 10th, and 11th grade. Those kids now. So, I mean, I'll, I'll use my son as, as an example. Every, you know, as his freshman year, the following year he scored three points higher on the pre-AC, the following year four points higher. And so, I, in my mind, from a, from a predictability standpoint, I can anticipate what I think he's going to land as a result of taking that actual ACT that they, they took a week ago or so. Monday, last Monday. Last Monday. I can predict. I think I have an idea of where he's going to land, and I can already start having conversations with him about which colleges, colleges you either need to worry about applying to and which ones don't waste your time. So. And to speak on the strategies part, you know, assessments aren't punitive. At least I don't view them as being punitive. I mean, it's practice on some levels. And with tests like the ACT, a lot of times it is just strategies, right? Um, you know, if you're taking a reading exam, you know, read the answers first and then try to find it in the text. You know, don't spend 20 minutes reading 15 paragraphs trying to answer the question, right? And those are the type of things that kids learn in prep courses, right? So. Um, as they get better and more familiar with taking assessments, they, they, will, they will perform better. One last question. In Tyler, there is assessments for your child. You know how it's yep. different. I, I never see ACT in there or any of these. Are, are they available to be put in there? Or is it yeah. Okay. Yep. I, I know they're in there because I took pictures and sent it to my kids. So they are. Well, it's under. It's under. Uh, it's under assessments. There's it's like under assessments, not grades. All right. So we need to figure out why that's not the case. I can 
it's, it's in there for both of mine, all three years that they've taken the pre-ACT and my daughter, who's a senior now. So we need to figure that out because that may be an issue that for some of our families, if that piece is missing, it's hard for them to, you know, to be able to, to work with their kids and be proactive. So we'll look into that one, Ms. Wilson. Good evening. Uh, as Dr. Shepard said, we are hoping that our CCR framework helps us to have more success stories as we think about our scholars in KCPS moving towards college and career readiness. So as we discuss the implications of our CCR framework tonight, uh, I'm honored and excited to share with you an introduction to one of those success stories, Mr. Alan Brinson. I would like to talk to you a little bit about why we consider him to be a success story and tell a little bit about his journey towards college and career readiness. Alan is a proud KCPS student whom I had the pleasure of meeting at King Elementary when he was a little fellow, uh, and I served as his principal for many years. At the time when I think about Alan, he was squirrely, he was busy, he was determined. However, whenever he had a goal that was put in front of him, he always set out uh, with the insurmountable amount of determination to achieve those goals. Sometimes he would put his mind to things of mischief, as all kids do. Other times he would be extremely focused on success in his future. Allen was one of the first students in KCPS to take advantage of our district's kids to college program in the sixth grade. He also began to recognize that he was a true leader. As such, he was nominated as a student council member at the school and he was also nominated by his teacher to be one of those leaders who could run the school store for our younger students. This was the year that the seed was planted for him to begin thinking about attending college. After leaving King, he transitioned to Central Middle School where he would become a Warhawk. That's where the seed of college aspiration further germinated and his desire to grow as a leader was fostered even more. He was featured in the Kansas City Star for his participation in the Green Dot program. He was initiated into the National Junior Honor Society. He was a student youth of the month with the Boys and Girls Club of Kansas City, Missouri. And in eighth grade, he decided he wanted to join debate. It was during this year that again, I had the opportunity to work with Alan as he decided to make application to be one of the students in our first AVID cohort. As an AVID student, one of the things I remember talking to him about is, you are going to have to take these challenge courses, Alan. You're going to have to stay focused. And by challenge courses, we mean either a pre-AP or an AP or advanced course that would help him persist towards higher levels of college readiness coursework. As he progressed into high school, he became a Central High School Blue Eagle. He played on the boys' basketball team. He joined the KCPS MOCA mentoring group. He participated in the Upward Bound Trio program and he utilized the skills that he learned in Abbott 9 to help him during his freshman year to achieve a 3.8 grade point average. It was also at this time he received two nominations to come to the National Leadership Youth Summit in Washington, D.C. Allen is currently a 10th grade student in Abbott. He is still in MOCA, and he still demonstrates the impact and importance of moving towards college and career readiness. At the end of our program, you will have the opportunity to hear from Mr. Brinson yourselves. And this is Alan. Alan was not on the previous <laughs> slide. So as I stand before you tonight, I want to talk to you a little bit about AVID, which is the Advancement via Individual Determination Program. Uh, and what AVID is, is a college readiness program designed to help students to really begin to think about the skills that they need to work on in order to be prepared for college, but to persist through rigorous courses as well. We have AVID in 12 of our district schools, nine of our secondary schools, and this year we received a grant from AVID to pilot in three of our elementary schools. The program explicitly focuses on helping students to become stronger writers, better critical thinkers, developing teamwork skills, working on organization, which is the thing I hear them complain about the most, their binders and organization skills. And it also helps them with critical reading strategies and to be prepared for collegiate level literature. 
Currently in our Abbott Secondary uh, program, we have cohorts in the 7th through 10th grade. Last year was our first year of Abbott and we offered it in the 8th and 9th grade. We had 167 students that stayed with us in Abbott during that year. This year we have 303 Abbott students in the 7th through 10th grade. I will be back in June to discuss a full presentation on AVID. I don't get to share the stage with my team. Uh, I'll be before you, but we'll talk about some of the impacts and what it looks like for our students that are participating in AVID in schools and some of the successes that we see and then opportunities we want to capitalize to help them in their journey for college and career readiness. As we think about the CCR cards that you have in front of you in our district framework, uh, AVID is one of those programs that the district uh, and Dr. Bedell has been extremely supportive of uh, that's threaded throughout the entire CCR framework from the time that students enter 7th grade through the time they exit uh, in 12th grade. And so just talking about the pillars for 7th and 8th grade, uh, where we talk about the exposure and strength inventory, one of the components that AVID provides is the opportunity for students to take the Strengths Explorer assessment. And you know, there's tons of research that shows that when students are able to identify their strengths, uh, both those natural and things that they have an interest in and connected to things that they want to pursue as far as degree programs and then even as far as the world of work and have those experiences, students experience more joy, more satisfaction, and they tend to persist towards that effort. College visits is a component that uh, is a part of the AVID framework in each grade level. Uh, because we want to provide our students with a large number of exposure to be on the college campus, to learn about the expectations for college students, to learn about entrance requirements, and really the importance of the work that they do daily in our buildings. Service learning as it is a graduation requirement. This year we have a number of our AVID students, uh, 7th through 10th grade, uh, that were tasked with developing service learning projects so that one, they can learn how to invest in themselves into their school community. Uh, and then two, to learn what it means to actually give back. Um, because we know that the district and our schools are the heart of our communities. And we want students that when they graduate, they're able to pour back into their schools and support other scholars. And then GPA tracking and goal setting. Uh, one of the components that the students learn in seventh grade, uh, which I know it gets on their nerves when they see me come over to the school to talk to them about their grades, uh, is that we really push the students to look at their GPA, to reflect on why they got that GPA, and then to set a goal for continuous improvement. Um, students that uh, fall beneath the grade criteria that we have, they have to do weekly grade checks. They have to do that weekly reflection on what they're doing that's helping them to experience success, uh, and what they'll continue to do, or what support is needed by either district staff or their AVID teachers uh, to help them to be successful. In the ninth grade for engagement and experience, we still continue with our college visits. Uh, we provide them access to college fairs. Uh, we also started working with our students on interviewing skills and public speaking skills uh, because we realized that last year that was a huge gap for many of our students. They did not want to talk in front of their peers or others. Uh, and so we started working with them on 30 second speeches. But now we can be more intentional and talk about this is how it connects to the world of work. Uh, and that there are businesses that are willing to offer you internship experiences uh, that you can start before you enter high school. And then also have an opportunity to connect with businesses where they actually say, we would love to have you and we can help you fund your college education by working with us. And then with that couple, we also have parent nights um, because we realize that in this walk, many of our AVID students are first generation college students. Uh, and their parents want to know and need the support on what they should be doing in order to help students. They also start to work on a life goals essay that's built on their Strengths Explorer results. Um, and they continue to revise that until they become seniors. Um, and we've looked at it and we've made sure that it can meet the requirements of their senior capstone. But really they build onto it each year with their experiences that they have. How am I continuing to evolve and move closer towards my goal of being a graduate? And then we start to work with them on scholarship practice and application. Because we know there's that one little box or one thing that might not be done on the scholarship application that can keep many of our scholars from getting scholarships uh, in the district. And then as we look at expansion and evidence, we continue with college visits uh, in line with the comments about ACT preparation. 
Uh, one of the things that AVID 10 is heavy on is helping students to understand vocabulary that they see on standardized assessments for college entrance exams. And it's honestly been one of those curves where our new AVID 10 teachers, we really had to provide a lot of support for them. Uh, but we found that it's been beneficial for the students to understand and to see what those weekly test questions look like and get that experience. And then as far as our CCR pillars when students exit in the 11th and 12th grade, um, because of the course of rigor requirement, it is connected to our AP, IB, and dual credit courses. Um, we see that through from middle school threaded all the way until they graduate from us. Our AVID cohort this year, one thing we talk to the parents and the students about is our goal is that you at least have a minimum of 9 to 12 college credit hours by the time that you graduate. And at, at the end of their junior year, they are actually ready to enter into the college. The one requirement that may be off is just their fourth year English. But as far as readiness for acceptance, that's one of the benchmarks that we have for them. And so you'll see throughout their transcripts and their experiences, those challenge courses are threaded throughout. Are there any questions about Evan? Mr. Hogan. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Um, do me a quick favor. Will you go over your, your interview, interviewing point under engagement experience just one more time? Just give me like the Reader's Digest version. I want to make sure the question I'm going to ask you um, is still relevant. Yes. So in interviewing, we help the students with public speaking skills and interview practice. Um, and we ask them to do their practice interview as if they are interviewing, one, for college acceptance, or two, for a career option. Okay. So um, I think it hits a little bit on my question, <clears throat> but I feel like the one thing that we're missing most with our kids, because I feel like the, the, the academic framework and the systems that have been built and continue to sort of be um, built out and strengthened are really, really good. Um, but the one piece, and I'll apply it to my own life um, here, is, is the soft skills piece. Mm -hmm. So looking at my childhood, like I wasn't the smartest kid. I'm never the smartest guy in the room. No need to agree, Mr. Marco. Uh, like how I cut you off there? It was coming. Um, and, and so, you know, I've never won in life because of my intellectual prowess. That's not my thing, right? But I had these really good, solid 10 foundational years before my life sort of fell off of a cliff, if you will. Um, and those years were really important for me. And so I can go build relationships, right? I can go... Um, have a conversation with just about anyone. I fit in wherever I go. I can weave in and out of different scenarios with pretty relative ease. Our kids don't have a lot of that. And I know a lot that's not the school district's fault, but it is our responsibility to try to build that up in our kids. And some of it's confidence. There's a whole bunch of reasons for it, right? But I feel like we, we need to have an intentional focus like no other in the same way that we have it on the academic side with this piece as well. And I don't, we don't talk about it a lot, I don't see it a lot. So what, what can we do to go build that into our kids' educational experiences? Um, uh, well, for AVID, the soft skills are, are embedded, especially when we teach students about collaboration, um, because I see that too, like students do not like talking about themselves. They'll have tons of good things that they're doing and accomplishments that they've made. And if you ask them one-on-one, -on -one, they can pour it out to you, but if you ask them to network and just start a conversation about themselves, they just freeze up. Uh, and so the collaboration piece within AVID helps students with those soft skills, and it puts them in a, a variety of scenarios. Um, so it doesn't always look the same. Like it may just start with, how do I meet other people in my class and build community? How do I introduce myself to people who I might don't know? Uh, and every opportunity that they have for that, it changes. So a lot of our students, um, areas I've seen the soft skills grow is when we have guest speakers come into their class from the career force that are actually able to help them with that networking, uh, to help pour into them about their strengths. Because a lot of them aren't um, strong students. Uh, however, we speak to them as we see them to be. Uh, so I think as intentional as we can be where we have opportunities for touch points to put those soft skills in, students will get better at it. If that's AVID is for what grades? AVID is currently 7th through 10th grade. And it'll continue growing. So next year will be our first group of 11th grade students. Gotcha. So Dr. Biddle, this is something I think, I mean, 
mean, I feel pretty passionately about this. I think we need to start this in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. Right? You can't wait until 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th mm -hmm. grade to, to get some of this stuff going. you got to, like, when kids come in the door into pre-K and kindergarten, you know, some of these foundational soft skills, shaking hands, right, looking people in the eye when you're talking to them. Again, things that our kids are coming in struggling with to begin with, but how do we go build up right. those skills and that confidence in them from the minute that they come in the door? Because you can be really, really strong academically and still not do very well in life if Absolutely. you don't have that confidence. All right, thank you. Before I start, Mr. Hogan, I do want to address what you were just saying because we all agree that it does need to start in kindergarten. And so with our very intentional focus to our iSpark um, curriculum, which is the Project Lead the Way, which starts in pre-K, we're able to begin to build those skills, those problem-solving skills, those critical thinking skills, those collaboration skills, and in a way that we're hoping kids to be able to identify it and talk about it. And so that's one way that we're being very intentional so that they can carry those skills through, not only in their elective courses, but just in every um, component of everything they do throughout their educational journey. I spark. Um, that's Project Lead the Way for Elementary. You're welcome. Okay. I am Rashawn Brothers. You may not recognize me because I have two good feet today. So, <laughs> But I am very um, happy to be here. And I do want to start off by just congratulating the students. Um, we had those really awesome students that were honored with those scholarships and with Scholar Superstars. And three of them happened to be manual students. So we could not be prouder of our um, engineering students. for a second. Um, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak about the amazing things that are happening in CT as, far, as well as our path moving forward. One of our proud moments this year, as most of you all know, was the opening of the Cardinal Cafe. I've seen many of you all in there. Some of you all, Dr. Bedell, multiple times. Uh, <laughs> he may need a separate account just for the Cardinal Cafe. Um, but the Cardinal Cafe is an entrepreneurial experience provided to our 11th and 12th grade students um, in the district at Mayo Career Center. As you'll hear in the short video um, that we'll show you in just a second, that was student and teacher created by our digital media class. Um, uh, students and staff were involved in the Cardinal Cafe are really gaining real world experiences. I cannot, we cannot as a team, tell you about how happy students are. And not just the students, these teachers. I can't even tell you how amazing they are. Chef Tom and Chef Dan are truly it's whatever you need, whatever kids need, whatever it takes to make this better. So we could not ask for a better team of teachers to really get this going. But students in this program, um, they, are learn they learn how to run a business and how to interact with customers. So that customer service piece, those soft skills that we um, talked about. So we'll, um, I'll let you enjoy the video and then we'll get back. Today will be a class in and of itself where our students have an opportunity to learn all of the aspects of running a business from making change in the cash register to tracking inventory to doing the marketing and all aspects of kind of the back of the house so to speak of a restaurant. Um, it is a student-led business where students have an opportunity to get these real-world skills each day while they're here. Well, this year in the Cardinal Cafe, we are running a menu that is changing and evolving all the time. As the kids learn new skills, you're going to find new things out here in the cafe. And when that happens, it's exciting for the students, for the instructors, and especially for the customers. It is awesome. Our students learn what it's like to work in a real-life atmosphere restaurant. Well, daily in the Cardinal Cafe, we have a prep list every day of things that have to happen. We have to make the chef salads, the Caesar salads, the chicken strawberry salads. We have to make the wraps. We have to make the sandwiches, the soup. I mean, it is a high production kitchen at this point and will be for the rest of the year. Sorry I didn't bring any. <laughs> yeah, something tomorrow, absolutely. Yes, yes, thank you for that quick commercial for tomorrow, absolutely. And my teacher informed me today that 
um, the students were, they finished the um, Spanish subtitles for the Red Birdie Digital, which is our digital marketing class, but the students have added subtitles to that first video and they will add them to the other videos as well. So as long as uh, someone turns on the closed caption, they'll be there. Our students and teachers are truly, truly awesome. So I'm sorry, I can't, yes. I can't let you go any further okay. without saying this. Uh, it, yeah, I, I, I absolutely love that cafe, the customer service. I will be the first to tell you when I had that first mocha, I was like, hey, y'all, this was before they had opened up. I was like, listen, y'all have to do something with this. You trying to sell this to people? The, after they had the actual grand opening, I mean, the, the mochas were awesome. Um, I, I spent about $60 there yesterday. <laughs> I have issues, man. I don't know where they get this produce from, but it is the freshest produce. I've had the freshest salad that I've had here in Kansas City. And I'm not just saying that because it's our students. Go there and try it for yourself. Y'all know I'm greedy. All right. <laughs> and we do appreciate all of the support. We had a business meeting there yesterday, and Dr. Bedell was very generous to provide lunch for the, for the uh, attendees, which were all salads and desserts and um, a new lemonade that we're trying. And our cafe manager, we're, we're so proud of her. She is a former graduate of Southeast High School, um, and now she is our cafe manager. So, right, <laughs> shout out to Southeast. <laughs> so we're just very, very proud of all the great things that are going on, and we have a long way to go and lots of other cool things that we can do, but we're going to get there. So if you haven't visited, you're missing out. Um, so just thank you again to everyone, including the community, the students, and the staff. Tuesdays and Thursdays, short commercial. Okay. <laughs> yes. And Friday, this Friday, yes, this Friday, but typically Tuesdays and Thursdays, and special events. Okay, so the entrepreneurial experiences provided through the cafe is one component of our college and career readiness uh, framework, or CCR. Our team has mapped out, again, that you have in front of you um, what CCR looks like for students in grades 7 to 12. So starting at the bottom, looking at that exposure and strength inventory piece, um, that is a great opportunity for our middle school students to have the opportunity to experience advanced grade level coursework, career coursework, and then programming geared toward college and career readiness, academic growth, and preparation for just the general high school career. So as Dr. Pedell mentioned, as we prepare for m 6 which comes in 2022, uh, we are being very proactive in how we're preparing our students. Our seventh graders will be required to complete individual career academic plans, so we're going to go ahead and get started with that this next year. This will start our seventh graders on, the on a journey of thinking about their careers and talking to students, especially high school students. Some kind of know what they want to do, but a good number of them still don't know. And so we have to do a better job of preparing them, and that not only starts um, on that STEM journey in elementary, but it needs to continue and get stronger as we go from middle school to high school as well. The students will connect in seventh grade with industry professionals through NAPRIS, which is uh, AKA Connector, um, which allows students to uh, the ability to talk to any professional in any industry without leaving the classroom, which is very valuable. Um, so whether they want to run a cotton candy business or be an industrial engineer or aspire to be a CEO of a major corporation, will ensure that they connect with someone doing the work. And the other cool thing about NAPRIS is they get to see the environment in which someone works. So if they want to talk to a scientist, they can see what a real lab looks like in, in an industry setting. And not only can they connect with outside entities, teachers can also use the platform to learn about programs even within our district. For example, the students in Ms. Brewington's middle school class at Northeast Middle, um, they wanted to learn more about culinary, culinary arts. So through the leadership of one of our culinary students, as well as our real world learning coordinator, Crystal, um, students were able to ask questions and learn about the culinary industry as well as learn about the programs and manual while still being at Northeast Middle. So that was very, very powerful. And we applaud Ms. Brewington for giving those students the opportunity. And lots of more opportunities are out there. We just have to um, take advantage of them. And for our eighth grade students, through that same exposure and strength inventory, they'll, uh, they'll continue their career exposure through a careers course. Students will study many careers, they'll take field trips, um, to industry, they'll use client-based experiences to client-based projects, they'll interact with guest speakers, and, and so that they are very informed of all of their options before choosing their high school pathway, which moves us to the next um, piece of the framework, that engagement and experience piece. So that engagement and experience piece is centered around ninth grade, 
in ninth grade, uh, students will select pathways, or actually the uh, at the end of their eighth grade year, they'll select pathways uh, based on their zones and their interests. So, for example, the Southeast Central Zone is one zone, and the Northeast East Zone is the other zone. Students will work through courses, and then they'll complete their capstone, which are displayed in the pillars on your sheet. Uh, students will also continue to engage with partners on client-based project, projects to make their resume strong and help them to be ready to pursue those post-secondary options. During that 10th grade year um, of expansion and evidence, uh, the students will be really focused on stackable credentials. Uh, students will be sitting for their industry-recognized credentials during their junior and senior years, so we have to get them into the mindset to really get ready for that task. We have to prepare them. So during the 10th grade year, when students are sitting for their stackable credentials, that can look like anything. It may be CPR, it may be a food handler's permit, it may be OSHA 10, um, but students will learn the importance of being college and career ready. And then during their junior and senior years, students will have the opportunity to work on those pillars where you see the college credit, the work experiences, etc. Sherelle, when she comes up, will speak more to the, the dual credit piece during her presentation. But dual credit will not only be an option for the core, but for CTE courses as well. And we've already started on that work. Uh, students will also have the opportunity to have real world ex experiences, experiences through meaningful internships or, again, more client-based projects. Uh, students at manual are already bringing life to what client-based projects can and will look like for our students. The digital marketing and media students are constantly working with internal and external clients on real work. They start from conception, from brainstorming, from a brainstorming session, um, to working with the client all the way through. They receive real feedback, and I've been a part of this, and so it's some members of my team, and they really, they want it, and they, they give feedback to each other. It's, if you've never experienced this with them, it's a very powerful experience. But so they receive real feedback from their peers, from their instructor, and from the clients. Uh, students will also have the option of earning IRCs or industry recognized credentials. So what IRCs do is they signal to employers that students are highly qualified to enter an entry level job, and then they can move up based on additional training or schoolwork. And we tell students all the time, even if you are going straight to college or you're going straight to career, whatever the case may be, these are skills that no one can ever take away from you. And we know how fluid the job market can be. And it's always good to have a quote unquote side hustle or and that side hustle may become what you're truly passionate about or it may provide the opportunity for you to um, earn a really good um, income while you're in college. So you don't necessarily have to work at McDonald's or something like that. You could do hair or because you have your cosmetology license or you might work at an auto shop because you have a collision or tech license. So there are lots of options. We are already very excited that we have some success stories, especially in that um, industry recognized credential field. So for example, in auto collision, to date, 70% of our auto collision students have earned their IRC, which is the earliest that we've achieved this goal. Um, students have until the end of April to earn their credentials, so we'll get there. Um, another success story is our new water management uh, program, which you all have heard a lot about. And many of you all have met Mr. Lopez, who is extremely passionate about his kids um, and about the programs after 40 years of service with the Kent City Wire Department. Um, but we are proud that Kent City, Kent City Public Schools, has the only two high school students in the country with this honor of those um, water management credentials, the only two. And lastly, and you all have met Nason, but we would like to introduce you to Christian. Um, but, and lastly, we have 100% of our Project Lead Away students that have earned an advanced standing on the principles of engineering EOC. Um, so students will sit for their architecture EOC and POTW in April. So a lot, a lot of great things, and that's just a small sample of all the amazing things that are happening. Um, but for our entrepreneurial experiences, in addition to the Cardinal Cafe, we will be developing more opportunities for students. They love it, we love it, they're learning, they're having fun, the, the teachers are having fun, because we really want to make sure that they pursue their passions. Uh, we encourage collaboration through these experiences in our digital media, culinary and construction crew. Our teams are a really good example and have served as a great model for, this, um, for that this year. The classes have worked together to truly make the cafe to come to life. And Dr. Bedell mentioned some of the pro produce, and I don't necessarily know where they always get it from either because it's so amazing. Um, but they do uh, also work with our agriculture program over at East. And so it is our goal to 
beef this up so that we're doing a very farm to table um, where the ag kids are growing the food and the culinary kids are serving it. So um, there's a lot of great things that are happening that we are going to um, use in order to help move the district like Jerome talked about from 43 to 49 as it relates to that advanced placement goal of industry recognized credentials and project lead the way. I also mentioned these pathways that we're working on with the high schools. Um, East started their pathways about three years ago as a result of the signature grant and so they really have a great thing going so by using their model and learning from their obstacles uh, we were able to then put together the pathways for the other comprehensive high schools of East, I mean of Southeast, Central and Northeast. It's still very much a work in progress but the principals have been great. They have been open-minded and very collaborative about how are we going to provide the best opportunities for our students. So this is just one example, and this has actually even changed a little since this morning because we just continue to work on it to make it really, really strong for our kids. But if a student is interested in nursing, they would just go all the way across where they'll start with that freshman academy for next year, and then they'll continue on to a project lead the way course in, in biomed, take anatomy and physiology, and then they'll end at health science at manual, or they might go into EMT, um, or they might want to go to the teacher route. Regardless of what it is, they have options. And so we have this for every career cluster that you see at the top of your um, card. We're around arts and communication, business, industrial, engineering, tech, agriculture, and health and human services. So we have a lot going on. And thanks to you all, I have truly an amazing team to help do this work. And it's because of your approval to increase the staffing for our CTE department that we're really, really able to now get a lot of stuff moving. And so this is just the beginning. We have a lot more to go, and I have lots of ladies with lots of wonderful ideas. Any questions? Ms. Cortez? So as you've been putting, this is really impressive. Thank you so much Thank for you. kind of. I am going to flunk the microphone test for the rest of my time on this board. Just saying. No judgment. <laughs> I appreciate that. So. So, one of the things that I hear a lot out in the kind of the industry world is um, how people who go down one pathway mm -hmm. need to develop the critical thinking mm -hmm. and kind of both critical thinking slash flexibility, mm -hmm. but also the confidence right. to take on new learning, new mm -hmm. skills, new pathways. So, can you share with us a little bit about how that's kind of baked into the work that Sure, absolutely. And that's why we really um, wanted to start in elementary with that ISPAR curriculum, because what we didn't want to happen or what we saw happening was students weren't really able to have these experiences until they got to high school. And that was too late. And so using those common sector competencies of the things you've talked about, because we hear that a lot from employers, we can train them to do any job, but we can't train them to be at, be to be at work on time or put their cell phones away or problem solve or pivot or whatever those things are. So how can you as a school district help us? How can we partner together to do that? And so through our client-based projects, through our work experiences, through basically those pillars as well as the foundational pieces, we're going to be very intentional with the way students interact with clients, the way they interact with um, the coursework, the opportunities that we give them to present um, and stand up and be noticed and gain that confidence. Because we found that students will do the work, but they'll do it 10 times better when they know that somebody from the outside is going to be judging them. And so by um, baking that into every aspect of what we do, and we just need to give students opportunities. And we have to be very intentional about it. And like I was saying earlier, we have to point it out to them. We have to say, you did a great job at critically thinking when you did this, or thank you so much for pivoting when that wasn't working. So that way they'll be able to use that same language when they're at a job interview or when, when they're at an internship experience, whatever the case may be. We have to give them the language that we want them to be able to speak for themselves. I just have one uh, quick question. I think this is fascinating and I can see how you, you're building this out and um, I, I love the framework. It's also very complex. There are a lot of options here. Yes. And so, uh, you know, I, I wonder how does a student and a family first encounter this information and how do they make their own choices about the path they will go? And then the second question I have 
is a little bit around the tracking piece. You know, when we talked earlier, when Mr. Williams was up, is all of this embedded in the students in the Tyler system? Like, is a student earns an industry recognized credential? Like, where is that collected? Because if I just know kids can't keep track of those things, families may not even fully understand what all they have. Mm -hmm. Where does that reside? Sure. Um, thank you for your question. I'll answer your first one first. So, um, we have been working with the principals to develop an open house schedule or spring open house schedule um, for their families to not only engage in the pathways but pretty much everything that that school has to offer and we are inviting students from eighth grade to 11th grade to engage in all of the departments that are represented here will be present and we'll have specific sessions around the pathways so that we can answer any questions and begin to introduce them to it we will also be working with the communications team to create some very parent and student friendly, community friendly um, literature um, that helps to break it down in a way that is clear because it is very complex, but it is very important that we give the students options so that they can have voice and choice, but we also make it need to make it clear and accessible to all parties. Um, the second part of your question was... It's kind of about, like, where's what's the repository for the things yes. that students acquire over the course of their time and going through this secondary effort? Sure, sure. and we have worked um, hard to, I believe it, the IRC is on their transcript, um, so our amazing counselor has worked with um, Dr. Wilson and his team to um, put what IRC they have earned on their transcript. Um, so at least it's there for, obviously for future, for current, um, and you know, so that is a, an official record. Uh, we will, as we continue to develop this and um, work with the team, we'll also work with IT to see what pieces can we put in Tyler, because we do want students to be accountable, because we have to teach them how to track their learning to be accountable for their own education. And so by putting into the SIS system, we know that they have access to that, as well as parents. We just have to figure out a way, again, to make it very clear um, so that they can see not only how are they tracking on this, but also those um, soft skill, those common sector competencies. We have to figure out how to make some sort of rubric um, so that they can see, oh, you know, I, I know I can think critically because I've mastered these components, et cetera. And, and Tyler is very, <clears throat> very flexible. We'll be able to build that into what we're doing with this work. Okay, well, next up will be my colleague, Sherelle. Can't hear me? No? This is better? I forget. We did this this morning. Rashawn's a little shorter than I am. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I am Cheryl Faust, Director of Innovation and Post-Secondary Programming, Translation, AP, IB, and Dual Credit. It usually clears things up. Those are the three areas that our students can gain college credit. And we will watch a short video of students actually in action with dual credit. Well, I'm Christina Comey. I am the teacher of the Educator Preparation Program here at Maple. The Educator Preparation Program, the goal is to grow our own teachers. That way, we have students from the KCPS district coming back to teach with us. In this program, you will learn how to create lessons, and then you actually get to try out those lessons three days a week. And with this program, you can earn dual credit through UMKC or Northwest Missouri State if you meet the requirements. Students that um, are very hardworking do excellent in ed prep. Um, you also need to be organized, self-motivated, and really enjoy working with children and have great attendance. Because we go out to the elementary school three days a week, those students and that mentor teacher really depend on you.
So as you can see, this is one of our CTE programs. Um, I think Sean mentioned this one too, through manual. And one of the students that you saw focused in on is a senior at Northeast, and she is hearing impaired, and she's able to go to Gladstone Elementary and help other hearing impaired students. So obviously she wants to go into education. What we'd like to see are more students participating in this program so that they can hopefully come back and fill our own teacher vacancies, kind of a grow your own program. So with this, um, Chalet is able to walk away with three credit hours from UMKC, and whether she chooses to go there or another school within the state or even perhaps outside of the state that will take this credit, she's able to go ahead and get that program started earlier based on having this hands-on experience within our district. So if you're referring to your structure here, um, the CCR one that we've been referring to throughout the evening, that would be an example of our top pillar, the one to the left, that is college credit, what students typically access as a junior or senior. So starting from the bottom when it comes to college credit, the best way to expose our 7th and 8th graders is by having them involved in rigorous advanced coursework or the middle IB program. And then once they're able to go to high school, students like Alan that Jermaine spoke about, they can start to access our pre-AP and AP courses. An example of that would be our human geography course that was added throughout all of our high schools last year, targeting ninth graders specifically. And then moving on to 10th grade, again, being able to access more pre-AP and AP courses. An example of that would be U.S. history that was added this school year, targeting our 10th graders. And we also have students who are testing more in our world languages so that they can get college credit, students that are bilingual, biliterate, so we're prepping them on Saturdays, AP um, prep Saturdays each Saturday in the spring every month so that students are better prepared to do well because, of course, with AP, where they actually receive the credit is through passing that exam at the end of the semester. So when it goes to 11th and 12th graders, um, such as we just saw again with Chalet, that's when you can access most of our college credit opportunities. We have students who are able to take multiple AP courses after experiencing those in the 9th and 10th grade. And then they also have access to dual credit. An example of that would be our early college academy. So when students are selected in the 10th grade, of course, they're going over to our Penn Valley campus full time. And so the entire time they're working on their high school credits, they're also receiving college credits. So at the same time they receive a diploma, they're walking away with a 60 credit hour associate's degree. Now, whether they go straight into the workforce or choose to take that to a four-year school, that's an opportunity they start right here with us. Another opportunity that we have as of this year is students having a dual enrollment course. So they go over to Penn Valley after school, and we actually provide transportation to get them there and to bring them back in time for a later bus. So we have 10 students this year because we got it started just this spring, but that's an opportunity we will continue into next school year with lots of marketing at the spring open house that Rashawn mentioned. We'll tell um, families about these opportunities and students will have a choice between taking dual credit during the school day through UMKC or taking dual enrollment courses after school with MCC Penn Valley. So if you look at our numbers here, you see what an exciting time it is for college credit in our district. You see the growth from last year having 189 students in AP courses to that number growing to 282 this school year. We anticipate that number growing even more with an estimated 10 new courses throughout our high school, some of those in content areas, some of those in our fine arts areas. And then when we look at our IB Diploma Plus candidates, of course, those are students that have access to our IB programming. And much like our students who are selected in 10th grade for ECA, they're also selected so that they take full course loads of IB their entire 11th and 12th grade years. So you see a slow uptick that's happening with those students as well. And the 47 is a reflection of that junior class right now that will be eligible for next school year. With dual credit again, you see the numbers slowly rising. That does not include our ECA students. Those are students that are in our dual credit classes within the comprehensive high schools. Again, that being an increase for next school year, being able to add five new courses, and that will be with some of our credential teachers, and we're actually offering this through UMKC with teachers who are not yet credentialed, but they're able to pair with UMKC instructors so that our students still have that opportunity. 
So whether students are accessing it through AP, IB, dual credit, like Rashawn mentioned, we will be adding some of these courses on top of the CTE courses as we build out those pathways within certain schools. So they'll have opportunities um, in various ways, and of course they're advantageous so that when they leave us, that's time and money that they're able to save once they choose to go to a certificate or having that two-year degree or a four-year degree. Questions? Thank you. Mr. Barca? This is incredible. Uh, so kudos to you and the, the team that supports um, all of your efforts here. Um, I, I wonder, um, as you have your students that you had said, uh, some have access to up to an associate's degree basically, um, do we track any of the success rate as they transition or matriculate from um, even, I guess, the, the other side of the community college to a four-year uh, program? And their success rates or maybe their struggles and challenges there. Um, I graduated with 30 college credits and I went into college thinking that I could take sophomore level classes and that was a stark reminder that I wasn't a sophomore in college. Um, and so I'm wondering if we have students that are experiencing that same um, experience because they took advanced courses then uh, in high school and, and just didn't have that gap filled um, to be ready for the next level. That's a great question. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, and I know this is not necessarily something in terms of um, state requirements or anything like that, but I'm just thinking is the achievement of our scholars and their the graduation rate beyond. I think that would that would be something that I'd be interested in seeing as to how successful we are in, in that, because I'd hate to see us preparing students uh, with 60 uh, college credit hours and then dumping them at a university that they're not going to be successful at. So I think that's something maybe uh, we can look into. So thank you. I, I think that my question was on, um, on the advanced placement, what you were saying to us so that I can understand. Mm -hmm. For the next school year, there, you're estimating there will be 15 new course offerings. Those will be in the comprehensive high schools, correct? Okay. And that's because you were able to double, are you doubling the number of AP um, certified teachers? Is that... Yeah, we will continue to work with our teachers, but it's also adding additional AP classes. I mean, as you know, each year we will try to make sure that there's a mandatory AP class for students to take. We started last year with AP Human Geography. We have AP U.S. History, and I think, I don't know if we're moving to AP World History or which one it is next year, but our goal is to make sure that we're gradually moving that and then also taking into account that there are other courses that kids may have or they may have a course request for that allows for us to work with our teachers to get them that AP certification. Mm -hmm. Some of our teachers will be getting um, trained this summer and teaching AP for the first time and some of our current AP teachers will be adding additional courses. So that was my next question. What, it's not a huge timeline then to accomplish the, to get to secure the credential for a teacher. Can it be done, accomplished over the summer? So for AP they actually don't have to have a credential. They just have to have experience actually teaching the content. But Dual there's something is. that gives them a, the certification with affiliation with the university or? No. no. Dual credit, yes. Okay. But AP, okay. no. All right. Yes. AP, um, just having experience with the content area is really all they need. Um, they don't even actually require going to college board training, but we do have all of our teachers go to college board training. Mm -hmm. But with dual credit, they have to have 18 hours in an advanced degree in order to teach it. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Ms. Wolfson. I don't have a question so much as could we have in the Friday update the when you've identified all the names of the, the new courses in these two colleges? I, I'd love to see what's going to be offered. Okay. Yes, we can definitely do that. Our principals are in the um, process of finalizing those courses now and, and setting that up with teachers, but we can follow up with that information. Thank you so much for this. I'm really impressed and I just appreciate all of this today and I, I appreciate hearing how you guys are building out this program. Um, just a, a quick uh, um, observation from teaching the kids who are in the dual credit program, um, particularly at uh, the Penn Valley branch, I think that um, the kids do come very ready to learn. Um, I think that to probably to my colleague's point, thinking about some of their skills as far as organization and pacing 
or where I see some of the, um, so just this idea that if I have a problem, I have to reach out to an instructor or I have to pivot, you know, you guys mentioned pivoting earlier when something's not working or availing myself of resources, just a, an observation. So it's, it's not so much that they aren't ready for the material in my experience, it's more like they don't understand fully because they are still kids mm -hmm. how to um, comport themselves in a, in a setting like that. And so mm -hmm. I think that whatever gems y'all can drop to that effect would be helpful. Let me answer that one. I, I think part of what we did was when we made the decision to move Pam Pearson over there, that was a big focus. If you were to go over there now and look at the space and look at the supports that we have in place for them, um, to your point, we felt that they were in some cases kind of out there trying to navigate through. There is full-blown support. I actually went and visited on Monday or Tuesday and had an opportunity to actually talk to students and see it in action. But we have put those structures in place with our whole new management system that we have now. Because it was a lot of freedom. There's a ton of freedom. And I think you know that being an adjunct professor, uh, we've had to kind of rein that in and just make sure that our kids understand that everybody, we want you to matriculate through, we want you to pass, we want you to, to we want you to earn that associate's degree. And that has been an ultra sharp, a razor sharp focus of ours with, with Pam over there. And Ms. Pearson is doing a great job with that. Even with our 10 dual enrollment students, we have an additional day set aside for them that they don't even go to class, but it's optional for them to go over and receive support specifically from Ms. Pearson. And so she did a great job at the very beginning before they even started class with working with them on how to get into Blackboard and you know how to email an instructor when they might be absent from class. And so we are doing a better job of that. All right, um, I, thank you and good evening. I am Christy Harrison. I'm the Director of Intervention, Enrichment, and Extended Learning. And I'm gonna to talk to you tonight about our graduation PLC. And I know you've heard a little bit about this in the past, but graduation PLC is really the safety net that puts the whole framework together. So we really um, wrap around and provide the supports and the structures to ensure that we don't leave any students out there without the tools and the things that they need to be successful. So we have a graduation professional learning community that is a collaborative st strategic focus on increasing our graduation rates. Um, at each one of our meetings we have representatives from various departments as well as members from across each school building. All of our high schools are represented there and they bring teams with them. At these meetings, we have a focus on professional development, a data dive, and goal setting. Um, you can see here on the screen an exact example of one of our agendas and some of the work that we do. It's very intentional, it's very focused, you, um, and then you can see our monthly calendar of kind of where we're going and where we're headed. So we started back in September with simply just a data cleanup. Let's looking looking at first year freshmen, looking at what where our cohorts were and making sure that we had the correct information. Once we got there, we started really diving into understanding graduation rates and moving our students and um, all the way through the process. So as we work with those staff members, we're really talking about how can we find those gaps that our students have and how can we fill them. Um, we, we took all of the high schools on a visit to see what happens in our um, in a really successful grad labs and you know we put those into our buildings this year and so we have revamped those we have our grad coaches in there that are really working so we have that was one of our meetings we also work on failure rates and dropout rates and how that works at the ninth grade level um, all the way up and, where, and how that predicts our graduation rate as we're going through this, our focus this year has really been around the 11th and 12th grade because we're really trying to go slow to go fast. Um, but we really are moving into a direction where we will be looking at the whole picture. So we'll be looking 9 through 12. Um, so this is something that Dr. Wilson and I lead together, but we, we do this with a whole team of people. 
The, some of the work that we do here is seen right on the screen also. Um, this is an example of East High School's poster here, and we do, um, during our professional development, one of the things that we did is, what is your current reality? What are you working on? What's, what's actually happening in your building, and how can we move forward? We also set goals at each one of those meetings, and then we work towards those goals um, individually and then as a whole team. The work doesn't just happen at those meetings, it's taken from those meetings and back to the sites. And the sites then are expected to have graduation PLC meetings weekly within their buildings. So those meetings are kind of encompass what used to be individual attendance meetings and individual student meetings. It all becomes one piece. So we're, so, we're sort of um, wrapping around the whole child and looking at the whole picture as we go through this. Um, as we move forward in this work, one of the things, I don't think my new slide didn't get in here, but one of the things that we are um, doing is we are changing one of the roles. And so my title is actually changing next year to the Director of Graduation Supports and College Access. And so through that, I will be really focusing on um, helping get a college-ready environment at all of our campuses, focusing on some of the things that you addressed tonight. So really focusing on working with ACT prep, a college-going culture, helping students um, navigate the system to attain funding for college, um, FAFSA completion, college exposure at an early level, um, college degree attainment, the to and through process, and then really um, also some of the college tours and, and various things. So not only the supports that I've already been working on, but then adding in that college piece. And we just feel like this will be kind of the closing the gap piece that we have right now to be able to bring this work together. And that is what I have for you. What questions do you have for me? Go ahead, Dr. Jones. Thank you again. Um, so one of the things that uh, I've noticed, so I don't have a high schooler as a kid, but I do have a, a mentee. And just listening to some of the things that she says and some of her peers, um, when they talk about um, the things that kind of get them in the way, get in the way with them and make them wonder aloud if they are going to finish, is, is a common theme I'm, he I'm hearing lately is uh, interaction with teachers. So like, I fill out with his teacher, me and his teacher don't get along, or what have you, and so now I'm suddenly I'm having to encourage them, to, okay, go to this class. You need this class to graduate. Um, and so I wonder if one of your indicators, since you have a lot of them here in this uh, table on slide 55, is when you're looking at these, I wonder if it would be helpful to have an indicator, or as a red, one of the red flags could be a student is having an ongoing problem with a teacher in an integral class, like English or math. Um, that we know you're not going to be able to pass if you can't get, not that you should let any of them slide, but you know what I mean. Um, so that's just something that I've been observing lately. Sure, so absolutely, that's a really good question. And we know that the absolute number one factor is the teacher in the classroom. And we know that relationships matter. One of the um, pieces that I work with in the school district is also our middle college program. And as I talk with students through that, that program and what, what happened, it invariably almost always comes back to some sort of adult relationship that got in the way of something. And so we do know that that, that can be a problem for students. And so as we're looking at that, when we have these graduation PLC meetings at the building level, that is a perfect time for that team to be able to wrap around that student and see what is happening. We have our mentoring program, we have all of these programs and all these systems happening. Now that PLC meeting is a time that they can wrap around that kid and look at why isn't this kid, why does this kid have poor attendance, why is this kid missing, you know, why, are, why do we have all of these F's happening, why do we have these problems, and really look at that. So one of the pieces that we actually did recently was we pulled up failure rates and we looked at you know, students who are failing multiple classes. We looked at um, classes where there are multiple F's. And so what does that say? And then individual campuses were able to kind of make some um, decisions and really have some conversations around that information as well. Thank you. I have, um, my question is really around attendance. I know attendance, um, improvement and strengthening of attendance is part within our strategic plan. It sort of falls under some of this CCR area. And, and I, 
you know, I've heard you all talk in past times that when the coursework is engaging, when the, there are meaningful relationships with teachers, when those kinds of things are in place, we have a better opportunity to increase attendance. So are you, are you also kind of building in some framework as you build this graduation professional learning community that encompasses your thinking about how do we ensure, how do we boost attendance at that secondary level because that's where you can start to see students fall away and what are the elements that we're putting in how you know how we're putting this in place such that we students want to be there they feel that they're not losing ground in those other Right, so we have, um, our professional development right now is focusing really around uh, utilizing the data that we have and making decisions to support students. Um, but we do have a lot of efforts going around attendance within the district. So I know our school leadership does a really good job of working with principals and helping them to be really strategic in um, providing incentives and doing various things within the building. But then as we are looking at that in the grad PLCs, we're looking at individual students and how we can so support that individual student in moving them forward. Not so much as like the whole building picture, but that individual child and, and what are, is getting in the way. One of the things that we did in January is we actually talked about um, failure rates and dropout prevention. And so we actually looked at some data that um, indicating your eighth grade attendance and how that correlates to your graduation rate. And we really talked to principals about how they can use that data from our middle schools to start planning for their students as they come up. And so they can be proactive in really um, providing those supports for the students before they even get there. So we're trying to do, we're trying to help them to do some of that back end work to provide those supports, where I think our school leadership is doing more of the, um, in helping them to provide the incentives and the climate and the culture and those things within the building. Thank you, uh, Dr. Harrison. Thank you. And Dr. now Harrison. I- I'm fried, okay? Go ahead. Been late. I am really excited because I get to do, introduce Alan, so come on up. Good evening, Dr. Bedell, the members of the board. Thank you, Dr. Wilson, for the introduction. I am Alan Brinson. I am a KCPS scholar at Central High School. After I graduated in 2022, I wanted to attend the University of Kansas and obtain a degree in business management. As I, as I have thought about the program that I have participated in, I am thankful for the AVID program for helping me to understand what is needed to be prepared for college. I have also learned how to maintain my study habits and challenge courses. Because of my participation in AVID, I elected to take two challenge courses during my ninth grade year, AP Human Geography and Algebra II. This year I am in PAP English 10 and PAP American History. By being a participant in a Malka mentoring program, I have learned many skills that have helped me be a better young man and a productive young citizen. I am looking forward to being prepared for my ACT, making an application for the KC Scholars having many cor more courses for college credit, finding a career mentorship and internship in the business field. And I wish that I could participate in the business pathway that is coming to Central. I am thankful for programs that KCPS has allowed me to participate in, and as a committed average scholar, I am committed to being a graduate in the spring of 2022 that is more than ready to embrace my future college and career journey. And that's it. <laughs> So I do have just a, a couple of things to say to you. Um, you all know he's a, a, a scholar athlete. Um, he's also one of the kids that young men that participate in our in our mentoring branch. But at this program is Mocha, as you can see. He has on the uh, tie and the vest. And uh, Mr. Barker, I'm trying to figure out when I told uh, Daryl Davis. I'm trying to figure out when do I get my vest. I've, I've been. I, I don't have one either. I'm just 
So the vest, the sweater, any other swag? You know? Well, we both serve as vocal mentors, and um, this young man, uh, the future is extremely bright. I, I remember when I first met him, I mean, just his personality and his drive, and, and whatever we can do to help you on this journey, you know everybody in this room, we have your back. And I look forward to continuing to support you as you uh, matriculate through these next two years, because your sophomore year is pretty much almost over now. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for sitting through this very long evening. You've already got some of the best skills you need, which is persistence and patience. <laughs> It'll carry you far. So, uh, Mr. Martin. Yeah, I just want to echo everything that Dr. Bedell said and challenge my colleague Nate Hogan, who said that we don't have any or that we need students like yourself um, so that he can come and join the Mocha Mentor Program and meet several men uh, that have these soft skills that he says. Uh, I'll further say that you suggested you needed a business internship, and I'm sure several of us on this board can easily connect you to any business that you probably have interest in. So uh, we look forward to helping with that. We'll take care of this one business item, and then we'll come down and take a picture. Um, I know I don't have the clicker, but the, uh, the item for here we go. The next board meeting, the item that we will ask the board to take action on is the Sherwood Center contract for our outsourced services for our students in the amount of four hundred twenty-two thousand four hundred thirty-six dollars and fourteen cents. Thank you. Thank you. Before we adjourn. I just want to say thank you again for welcoming us to Troost Elementary, Dr. Fowler. We have had a wonderful visit here. The school is beautiful. The kids are talented and winners, we can see, every one of them. And uh, it's a tribute to you and your staff and team, many of whom were here tonight. So thank you for welcoming us. It was a thrill to be here. And I think there's one more thing to say. I do. I have to also, I see our IT team, faculty members, and our communication team, and also our facility services teams in here. I do want to thank all of you uh, for your work in making sure that today worked out well. So thank you all, and uh, definitely know that you are appreciated. So before I wrap this gavel, which will adjourn the meeting, um, I do want to say this is a, a tradition that we've sort of built over the last five years, which is doing these off-site school board meetings. And we do understand as a board the incredible work it takes, the, the many staff that are involved in making sure that the school is prepared and ready, that there is IT, that there's all kinds of support. And so we thank all of you um, for helping us fulfill a commitment to be present out in the community. So.